Hi, welcome to Truth for Transformation. I am Timothy Brown, and I'm so delighted you decided to study God's Word with us today. We're gonna to be breaking God's Word down verse by verse and applying it directly to your life. Our goal at Truth for Transformation is to encourage you, equip you, and empower you to live out all that God has for you. So get your Bible ready. If you have coffee, get that ready. And let's pray together as we prepare our hearts. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us your word. We believe that every word is inspired by you and it's profitable for doctrine, teaching, and correction. So Lord, help us not to just be informed by your word, but help the truth lead to transformation. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, how is everybody? Good to see a full audience on Labor Day weekend. We want to welcome you. Welcome to those who are watching online, traveling. I'm Timothy. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we finish our series, Summer in the Psalms. So we'll give you a little preview. Next week, we're going to do a special emphasis that's kind of on my heart. And then the following Sunday, we're going through the Gospel of John. Each week, we're going to try to cover a different chapter. So that'll be an exciting series as we journey with Jesus in the Gospel of John. So if you're visiting here, I just want to welcome you. This is a place where you can call home. Our mission here is to lead people from darkness into light, and we're just excited what God is doing in this church. And um, God's got a special message today. We're going to be in Psalm 150. You can go and turn there. As you turn there, a few announcements. Number one is this Wednesday we're having Starting Point, which is we call Art and we call Radiant Culture Class. And Radiant Culture is basically a class to get to know about the church, our vision, our beliefs, our values. So if you have not yet joined the church, you've been coming, or you just want to check it out, that's this Wednesday at 6. There's still time to sign up. So that's, that's happening. Also, all of our Wednesday night activities have relaunched. Uh, Brother David Whitson's got his class going. Um, we got um, some more classes coming up soon, and the youth are active, and children's ministry. So all those are happening Wednesday night. So if you are not involved in a class, uh, let us know. And I think Mark's class starts, is it two weeks? September 18th. September 18th. So his class relaunches. So this is the fall. We got fall classes relaunching. So we're excited about that. If your last name ends in N through Z, it's your week to do what? To invite someone to church. Every week we empower our congregation to basically let's, let's be about the business of spreading the good news, uh, sharing the gospel, but also inviting people to church. And if your last name is a, ends in A through M, it's your week to pray. You're part of the prayer team. So I encourage you guys this week to, as you go out in the business place, restaurants, remember to invite, remember to welcome people to the church. All right, well, let's prepare our hearts for the Word, if you would pray with me. Father, we give thanks that You're good. We are thankful for the Word of God. And so, Father, as we look into this final psalm, Psalm 150, we just pray that Your blessing would be upon it. We ask Him, pray that You would speak to our hearts. We pray for all those who are traveling this Labor Day weekend, that You'd give them safety, that they would know even though they're not here, that they're here with us online, that we do uh, pray for them as well. So, Lord, we bless this time, and we pray your blessing on your word. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. So, again, welcome. We're going to be in Psalm 150. And, of course, this is the last psalm out of the Psalter. Um, hopefully, most of you took the challenge. We challenged everyone to read at least two psalms a day. How many of you took the challenge this summer? All right. The rest of you who didn't raise your hand, you still can read the psalms. It's really good. Uh, we're encouraging everyone to read through the book. So it's been a great blessing just to explore the highs and lows of life, explore the majesty of God, how good He is. So in Psalm 40, a little background. I want to read a few quotes from scholars throughout history. Charles Spurgeon, the chief of preachers as he's been known as, he says, let the clash of the loudest music be the Lord's. Let the most joyful of all themes be our Lord's praises. Let us express praise as a rapture with the most exhilarating music, and we can never rise too high in our adoring notes, spoken only like Spurgeon can talk. 
John Piper, modern-day pastor, he says, Psalm 50 calls us to praise the Lord with everything we have, voices, instruments, and breath. This is not just a psalm. It's an invitation to join the whole creation and the highest calling we have, worship. Martin Luther, he says, this psalm instructs us to bring our whole lives into the presence of God. And this completes the songbook, Psalm 150 completes the songbook with the call to all creations to join the chorus of creation in praising the Creator. I love that. And Alexander McLaren said, this psalm is more than just an artistic close to the Psalter. It's a prophecy of the last result of the devout life. And in unclouded sunniness, as well as in its universality, this proclaims the certain end of the weary years for the individual and for the world. So as we get ready for Psalm 150, I'm just wondering, are there anything that you need to praise God about in your life? How many of you are thankful that we got through COVID, right? Some of you are like, it's still around. I know, but remember in 2020, how many of you were just coming to this church in 2020? This is the first time. This church was shut down in 2020. Like, we, we met outdoors, back parking lot, under an open tent. How many of you were here under the tent? And what's fascinating is we know nationwide that the, the church has suffered since COVID, Right? And church as a whole has been on the decline, but how many of you know God is still working? There's churches that are still growing. So even though we were shut down, we gained more people than we lost. And by God's grace, this church has more active attendees than we've had since the 1990s, and that's since COVID. God deserves a hand of praise for that, right? God is good. And I just want you to think about your life. Think about the challenges you've been through. Think about the things that Satan tried to do to put you out, but instead it sets you up. Whenever you're following God, whatever the enemy throws against you, God uses the setback as a setup. Whenever Satan tries to throw something on the white dress of the bride of Christ, how many of you know we have a jealous lover? He's going to come and he's going to fight for his church. So we are living in the last days, friends. Culture is challenging right now, to say the least. The political arena is challenging. We, we, we see what's happening in our world, but this is the time for the bride of Christ to take its stand. The Bible says whenever sin abounds, grace superabounds. So I'm just calling on you to praise God. I'm calling on you no matter what happens, you have reasons to praise, to raise some praise. I'm going to give the Lord a shout of a hand. Yes. So in Psalm 150, we're going to read six verses, and the word praise is mentioned 13 times. So when we walk out of here, no matter what challenges you came into with today, no no matter what sorrow, no matter what obstacles you're facing, you're going to have reasons to praise. I've entitled this message, A Life of Praise, From the Sanctuary to the Streets. So we're going to read Psalm 150, and then we're going to talk about what this life of praise looks like. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with the timbrel and dancing. Is that the right translation? It does say dancing, right? (laughs) All of our Baptist Presbyterian are like, is that in the Bible? It's there, all right? Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Someone say, praise the Lord. Lord. And we know praise the Lord is hallelujah in the Hebrew. So we're going to talk about this life of praise. What does it look like? As we close this book of Psalms, there's 150, this final psalm tells everything. If you have breath, if you're alive, you have reasons to raise some praise. So first of all, we have the who of praise. In verse 1, it says, praise God, praise the Lord. So first of all, praise the Lord. This is the word Yah, which is short for what? Yahweh. 
So we've got to praise the God who's trustworthy. Yahweh, whenever it's all caps and says Lord, it's often the word Yahweh. And this means that we can praise God because He's the great I Am of Exodus 3. God revealed Himself to Moses. I Am has sent you. Who is I Am? God is the sum total of all His characteristics. He is loving. He is holy. He is just. He's full of power. He knows how to handle your every problem. We serve a God who can handle it. Look at the person next to you and say, He can handle it. Yes. Uh, let's clap. Yes, He can handle it. This is Yahweh. This is the covenant-keeping God. So others may let you down. Family members may let you down. Friends may let you down. How many of you know you may let yourself down? But Yahweh, covenant-keeping God, never lets us down. Not only is He trustworthy, but He's almighty. Whenever it says, praise God in His sanctuary, this word for God is the word El. And it's an abbreviation for frequently used in Scripture, names like El Shaddai, which is God Almighty, El Elyon, the Most High, El Roy, the God who sees. So the who of praise is the God who's trustworthy, the God who is mighty. If I know who I'm praising, then I know that He's worthy of all praise. In fact, when Jesus came in His triumphal entry, the, the religious leaders chided his disciples and said, tell, tell the kids to stop. And you remember Jesus said, if they stop, who's going to call out and praise? Even the rocks are going to praise, right? In other words, all of creation needs to enter into this choral, this symphony, this chorus of praise to the God who's trustworthy, to the God who's almighty. In John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus talking about worship. He's talking to the woman at the well. He says, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Listen to this phrase, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Did you know that God is seeking worshipers? God doesn't need your worship. God doesn't need your praise, but He delights in it. The Bible says that He's enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Whenever you raise praise, whenever you worship God, God is found in the midst of praise, in the midst of worship. So God is everywhere, but whenever you praise Him, He can be experienced in tangible ways. Whenever you raise praise because of who God is, guess what? God shows up. So we have the who of praise. Next, we have the where of praise. Someone say where. Where should you praise God? Obviously, we'd answer everywhere. But in Psalm 150, he lays out different locations. First of all, in his sanctuary. If you can't praise God in the local church, where can you praise him, right? That's the easy one, right? It's easy to praise God at church. And as I've said in weeks past, we don't come to church just to worship. We should come to church worship, worshiping. Like Sunday is the overflow of Monday through Saturday. When you live a life of worship, Whenever you come into the sanctuary, it's an overflow of your life Monday through Saturday. So Sunday is when I come to overflow my thanksgiving to God. Where? Also in the mighty heavens. This is the heavenly course. Did you know that even while we're worshiping God here at Radiant Church, there's an eternal worship service going on in heaven right now? Isaiah 6, we get to peel back the veil and we see cherubim. Throughout Scripture, we see seraphim. We see holy ones, ones that are burning with fire, ones that are burning with passion. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So we can praise God here. And guess what? At the same time, there's praise going on in heaven. And that praise never ends. It continues on as this chorus, this symphony throughout eternity because God is worthy of all praise. So we praise God in the sanctuary. He's praised in the heavens. But here's something else. Praise Him in the public squares. This is worship in the streets. Notice it talks about the blast of the ram's horn, the dance, the clash of cymbals. These are all public displays of worship. I don't know about you, but it's easy to worship in the sanctuary. It's sometimes hard to worship in the streets, right? It's easy to express how good God is right here because we're Christ followers. But what about on the job? What about the grumpy boss? What about when you're in traffic and you have road rage? Is it easy to praise God then? 
Some of you are like, he's talking to me now, right? It, it's hard. But a life of praise overflows even into the streets. The other aspect is where in my personal life? Psalm 150 verse 6 says, let everything that has breath do what? Praise God. So if you are breathing out, that just means that God has breathed in you the gift of life. And because you have breath, you have reason to praise God. Even if you have nothing else going for you right now, the fact that God has given you life. The fact that you're taking up air on planet earth is evidence that God still has a plan for you. He hasn't taken you out of this earth. He has you here for a reason. Some of us may not know what that reason is, but one reason is to praise the Lord. Look at the person next to you and say, it's time to raise some praise. So that brings us to the why of praise. We, okay, we talked about the who, God, He's trustworthy, He's almighty, where, well, everywhere, in the sanctuary, in the streets, in the heavens, and in my personal life. But why? Like sometimes if you're struggling, you got to give me the why behind the what, Timothy. I, I know I should, but give me some whys. How many of you are thankful that God has saved you? I mean, just think about that. He he delivered you from a place called hell. He wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. You have eternal life, and heaven is coming down one day, right? You read Revelation, this new heaven, new earth is coming down. And one day we're going to live in a place where there's no more sickness, there's no more sorrow, there's no more pollution, there's no more traffic, right? I don't think there's going to be road rage in heaven, right? I mean, think about salvation, not only did He save you, but the Bible says when you became a believer, He gave you the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Now, in a few months, it's going to be Christmas time, and we talk about the mystery of the virgin birth, how Mary conceived Jesus, and how this was a miracle. And yes, it was a miracle, but what about Christ in you, the hope of glory? You have the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the third person of the Trinity, not the second person, Christ, but it's the third person. And as a believer, you carry the Holy Spirit with you everywhere you go. And that's the encourager. That's the comforter. That's the one that's going to lift you up when you feel down. Did you know when you don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit's praying for you right now with groans that words cannot express. Isn't it good to know you have a prayer partner who always prays in accordance to God's will? So you have the Holy Spirit. You also have the fruit of the Spirit. It's one fruit, nine flavors right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And some of you have said, well, I don't have patience. If you have the Holy Spirit, you do have patience. It's just maybe in small form right now. It needs to grow, right? You have all of the fruit, but you have to let the Holy Spirit grow that fruit. So don't never say, I'm not patient. You are. Patience just has to grow, right? And the fruit's connected. As I'm more joyful, then I'm more patient. I'm more patient, then I have more self-control. You see how it's all interconnected, one fruit, nine flavors. Well, it gets even better. Not only do you have the fruit of the Spirit, but all of you have at least one gift of the Spirit. Did you know that? God gave you at least one gift. Now, some of you have multiple gifts, but all of you have at least one. It's good to know what your gift is and what your gift isn't. As some of you told me, I cannot sing, and I realize that. I do it for com com comedy sometime on Sunday just to make sure you're still late. It's not my gift. Know what your gift is. All of us have a different gift. And that gift is not primarily to build you up, but it's meant to build up who? The church, okay? So I'm saved, I'm set apart, I'm filled with the Spirit, I've got at least one gift to the Spirit. Is anybody feeling encouraged right now? You also have a family, right? Some of you may not have family that live in this area, but you know you have a spiritual family composed of millions and even billions of brothers and sisters around the world? Did you know that you have family that are in heaven that you never met? They lived on planet earth before you, but one day you'll get to meet them. You know, I, I can't wait to talk to Peter. Peter, why did you cut that guy's ear off? Peter, why did you curse, right? How did Jesus restore you? Why wasn't it one strike you're out? Why did, why did he restore you? Like, Peter, stick your foot in your mouth, Peter. Like, what happened, right? So you're going to, like, give example. How many of you sometimes get bored of the book of Leviticus? Raise your hand. All of us, right? Well, look, can I tell you some truth about Leviticus? All those names, those who, not all of them maybe were of faith, but the ones who died in faith, you're going to meet those, many of those names in heaven, the ones that you can't even pronounce. 
So there's a reason why they're in Scripture. All of Scripture has a, a purpose. Well, I remember hearing about your name in Leviticus, and now I get to meet you. And that the best is yet to come. Just like Jesus in John 2, he turned the water into wine, and the governor of the feast marveled, and he said, you've saved the best until last. And that's the way God works. He gives you the goodness of God now, but then he saves the best for last. So that's the why. So all of you should have some reasons why. I should praise God because he's good and he's done great things in my life. I should praise God because he alone is worthy of my devotion, my adoration, and my worship. And by the way, the name worship, the word worship, the easy way to remember is worth and ship. It's anything you ascribe worth to. So I should raise some praise. I should raise some worship because he is worthy. So we talked about the who, we talked about the where, we talked about the why. And now we're going to talk about the how of praise. And at the conclusion of this point, even before the message is finished, just to prepare your hearts, one of the ways we can praise God is by taking the Lord's Supper. Every time we take the Lord's Supper, we are thanking God for sending Jesus to do what? To die for us. Every time we take that bread, we are reminded the body that was broken for us. His body was broken so I could have life. Every time we drink the grape juice, it reminds us that his blood was shed so he could do a new covenant, a new promise. And every time we take the Lord's Supper, we reflect and we make sure we're right with God. So as we go through this point, I just want to encourage you to prepare your hearts for the Lord's Supper. Are you in right relationship? Are you and Jesus okay? If not, just pray through the message. It's okay to pray through the message. Ask God to prepare your heart. So let's talk about the, the ways of how we praise God. In verses 3 through 5, the psalmist calls all the instruments together. And it's like every available instrument, brass instruments, string instruments, wind instruments, percussion instruments. And there's a chart on your listening guide. I don't have time to go through it, but you can tell there's a lot of research gone into that chart. But look at it on your later t- this week. It describes each instrument in the Old Testament, what they were used for, their purposes. So what I wanted to do in the time we have today is summarize, like, okay, how, is, how should we worship God? How many of you have ever been into a worship debate of what style of worship's appropriate, right? Can we have drums on back there? Is it okay to have lights? I mean, is smoke wrong? Is, is lights wrong? And people have all these questions. And do you know that Christians will debate this until Jesus comes, right? But can I tell you, even as we list the instruments, it's not so much about the instruments, it's about the heart behind it. The psalmist is saying that your heart should be so captivated by the Lord, you want to use every positive thing at your disposal to worship God. If it's a trumpet, if you're a trumpet player, I'm going I'm I'm to blast the trumpet. If I'm a dancer, I may not do it right here, but I may do it in private before the Lord, okay? Like whatever I have, I'm going to bring my full self as a praise of God. Because guess what? God made you. He also created your personality. And there's many ways that God accepts praise. So I want to kind of give you five things. This is on your listening guide. Number one, my praise should be a celebration of victory, Notice it says, praise God with the blast of the shofar. This is the trumpet blast. The shofar was a signaling instrument. It would signal to war. It would signal victory. It would signal, hey, pay attention. There's a big announcement. So whenever you had the shofar, it was a call to attention. It was a big announcement. So when I praise God, it's saying that I should celebrate what he's done. Do you have any shofar moments? Do you have any moments where you just want to tell everyone, maybe you post it on social, hey, guess what? Celebrate with me. Look what the Lord has done. Some of you have those moments. Those are moments to praise God, the, the celebration trumpet moments. Number two, my praise should be a response of reflection and worship. Notice it says praise God with the lyre and the harp. That's the guitar and the harp. So think about this. What response do I have to God? What things have I thought about my life that maybe it takes a little bit more meditation, but I should praise God? So you see, you praise God for the big things, but you also praise God for the little things that aren't little to you, and they're not little to God. The little things in life, like, God, thank you that I still have a job, right? Thank you that I still have my health. 
Thank you, God, that I can still see. Thank you that I can hear. Whatever, whatever that may be, we all have different ways to praise God. Some of you might thank you, God, I have a car, right? Thank you that I have a house. Whatever it is, we all have different things to praise. My praise should be an overflow of joy and excitement. And for the third point, this is going to challenge some of our intellectuals, analytical thinker, that some of us that are, how many of you would say, Timothy, I'm just not as emotional as, say, my spouse is, right? All right, half the people would raise their hand if they were being honest, right? I'm, I'm just not as emotional. No one wants to raise their hand for that. But think about it. Praise God with a tambourine and dancing. When's the last time you got a tambourine out and started praising God? Anybody want to be honest? <laughs> I can't remember the last time, maybe with my kids, right? So why would I bust out a tambourine and start dancing to praise the Lord? Well, it's the idea that I want to express my emotions back to God. I want God to know how good and how faithful He is. And I may do it in private. You know, oftentimes this was, you know, you read in the Old Testament, even as they were coming back from the war, from war the women would get the tambourines and start dancing and celebrating. That was their way of praising God, right? So we express this in different ways, but my point's with style of worship. Be careful before you criticize another church and how they worship God. I've, as a pastor, I've heard so many people criticize the church down the road and, well, that church has lights and sound and smoke. Listen, if they're praising God with the right heart, it doesn't matter what they have as long as it's for the right reason. So be careful not to project your preferences onto another church. Everyone has their own way. And if you go to other countries and you see people out in the streets and tribal and different, and it's like they're praising God differently than I, but that's okay as long as their heart is praising God. So if you see someone out in the parking lot with a tambourine, don't judge them. God may be doing a moment in their life. And someone said, amen. All right. My praise should be a public blending together of unity with diversity. Notice he says, praise God with strings and with flutes. So in the original Hebrew, this is the idea of usually a group of instruments playing together. Think about the strings over here. They're like different string instruments playing together in unity. So the idea is we're all different. No, no two of us are alike. And the good thing about that is we can all blend together as we worship Jesus. We're all different. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different stories. But when we come together in church, we're united around the person of Jesus. Amen? And finally, my praise should be a heartful, a heartful demonstration of passion and love for Jesus. Now, something, uh, if you come from a Baptist Presbyterian church, this is hard to understand. Praise with a clash of cymbals and loud sounding cymbal. So these are the brass sounding instruments. And you're like, why would anyone clang together loud noise? That hurts my ears, right? How many of you parents tell your kids, shh, you're a little loud, right? But if you're doing it in celebration and it's overflow and you're like, God, I want to raise some praise so maybe it gets a little loud. Maybe people around saying, man, that person's a little undignified. But listen, it's for the Lord. You guys remember David when he was out in the streets and his wife's like, hey, you, you're, you're like embarrassing me. You're embarrassing yourself. And he's like, listen, I'm doing this for the Lord. So I just want to encourage you with this question. When was the last time you busted out praise that was so heartfelt, that was so enrapturous of who God is, that you just felt like you were in a special moment with the Lord. You didn't care who was around. You didn't care who was watching. It was you and Jesus. Anybody remember a moment like that? That's what that's talking about. So in FAQ, before we prepare hearts for the Lord's Supper, people ask this question, okay, what's the difference between praise and worship? Anybody ever thought of that? What's the difference between praise and worship? You know, we, we have a, a section called praise and worship. Well, let me define it a little differently than maybe you've heard it. Praise is something that anyone can do. Because Psalm 150 verse 6 says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So even a lost person can offer praise. Even an animal can offer praise. Right? Anything that hath breath can praise the Lord. So praise comes out of your lips, and it's basically telling God how good he is. Did you know even a lost person can tell God how good he is? That won't save him or her. But the difference is worship is praise taken to a different level. It's taken to a spiritual level. Whereas praise comes out of the mouth, worship comes out of the heart. In John 4.24, it says that if you worship, true worship, it's got to be in spirit and in truth. So the difference between praise and worship, praise is telling God how good he is. 
And worship is from the overflow of your heart, worshiping God in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the truth of God's word. Now, if you're telling something about God that's not true, that's not worship. So that's where you got to be theologically correct. And that's where we need to test everything against the scripture. So if I'm saying something to God that's not true, that's not worship. Because worship has to be in spirit and in... So you better make sure you learn the Bible. Because we want to make sure the worship is correct. I don't want to say anything to God that's not true. Because that's, that wouldn't be worship. So as we prepare hearts for the Lord's Supper, I just want you to think about this scripture. And this is not in your listening guide, but I want to read a scripture to you. This is 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So I'm going to ask um, our deacons who are going to be serving the Lord's Supper to come on forward. I'm going to give a little instructions here. We're going to do things a little differently. We're going to have three lines at the front. And these lines are going to be an opportunity for you to come forward and remember the Lord. Now, for those of you who are a little sensitive to germs, I know it's you know, that season where it's going around, we do have it individual cups in each of the black tables. So feel free if you're like, hey, I don't want to get in a line. I want to be a little more private. Um, there are tables to my left and right and one in the back. So they're going to take the elements and you're going to come forward and basically they're going to hand you a piece of bread and you're going to dip it in the juice and you're going to take it. And this is going to remind you guys of what Jesus did. So the Lord's Supper, just to kind of put it into picture, it's kind of in three dimensions. In the past, you look back on what Jesus did for you. What did Jesus do for you? Someone tell me. He died on the cross. So it's past tense, remembering what he did. In the present tense, it says that we're to examine ourselves. The word examine has the idea of like, is there anything in my life that's not right with God? Do I have unforgiveness towards anyone? Um, is there any unconfessed sin I haven't brought to the Lord? So before you take it, make sure you confess that. I'm going to say a prayer in just a moment, and it's going to give you a chance to prepare your hearts. And then there's a future tense we often don't mention. It says you proclaim his death till he returns. So the future is as I take the Lord's Supper, I am reminded of what he did, but I'm also reminded that one day he's coming again. Because you know every time you take the Lord's Supper, you're thinking about his second coming. You're thinking about his soon coming return. So I want everyone to, to stand and we're going to take a time of reflection. Everyone just take a moment to stand and I'll give further instructions after the prayer. If you will, pre please pray with me. Dear Father, we did a whole psalm on 150 about reasons to praise God. And as Christians, the biggest reason we have to praise God is what, what, what you did by sending Jesus for us. God, we realize that you, you demonstrated your love for us and that while we're sinners, Christ died for us. We realize that you sent Christ, the greatest gift in human history, for us. And God, we don't take that for granted. So Lord, as a response to Psalm 50, 13 times we're called to, to praise God. We want to come forward today to take this Lord's Supper as just a, a demonstration of thanking you and praising you for being good to us. So, Lord, right now, prepare our hearts. And right now, no one looking around, if there's an unconfessed sin in your heart, just as the music plays in the background, I want you to go and tell God in your heart. You don't, obviously don't say it out loud, whatever it is. If it's unforgiveness, just whisper, God, I forgive that person. God, I shouldn't have said that. Just go ahead and prepare your heart. I'm going to just let you pray for just a moment, and then I'll close this in prayer. Tell God what's on your mind. Lay at his cross any sin, any struggle that you want to give to him.
Father, we come to you just thanking you for who you are. We do lay our sins at the foot of the cross. Please forgive us. We're sorry. And God, we want to remember what Christ did for us. So as we take this Lord's Supper, help us to reflect and remember what Christ did for us. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. And I pray you enter into this moment of fellowship, Father, fellowship that we can experience you in real and meaningful ways. Bless these elements as we take them, the body and the blood, and we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at Truth for Transformation. I pray that God's word really impacted your heart and really registered deep within your soul. If you are in the Asheville area or come to vacation here, we would encourage you to come check out Radiant Church. I'm one of the pastors here. We have a 9 and 1030 service. We'd love to get to meet you in person. And for those of you who are watching all around the world, we would encourage you to check out my website at drtimothybrown.org. If you made a decision, please let us know. And also we are sponsored by generous donors just like you. Your giving fuels this mission of getting God's word all around the world. So if you would like to partner with us, you can do so by going to drtimothybrown.org and click on the giving tab. I look forward to seeing you again next week for another edition of Truth for Transformation.